Welcome back to the AI Minds podcast. This is a podcast where we explore the companies of tomorrow being built AI first. I am your host, Demetrios, and in this episode, as always, it is brought to you by DeepGram, the number one speech-to-text and text-to-speech API on the internet, trusted by the world's top conversational AI leaders, startups, and enterprises such as Spotify, Twilio, NASA, and Citibank. Today, we are joined by none other than Islington Robotica's CTO, Nathan. How you doing, dude? Hey, thank you. Uh, great to be here. Thank you, Demetrius. Pretty excited. I'm doing well. Thank you. Well, you've got an incredible story because you are creating robotics right now, but you started out in sports and you did all kinds of technical stuff at university, went to work for Arsenal. And for those that do not know, that's a pretty big uh, football or AKA soccer team in the UK. What were you doing at Arsenal? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, well, I was teaching the kids and expanding their franchise globally. So I was a head coach there and just delivering the Arsenal methodology worldwide. It was pretty awesome. And I am guessing you were getting inspired by that to then plot and create a humanoid robot company in 2024, or you had no idea? Uh, hey, life is, a, life is like a beautiful accident. The, the job at Arsenal was... Um, something that I didn't ask for, but one of the Arsenal players, I was just coaching at the weekend, trying to get like some money up whilst I was at uni. And uh, one of the kids' dads came and tapped me on the shoulder, a French accent, really deep voice. Oh, you're very good. I was like, who's this guy? And it turned out to be like William Gallas, who was the Arsenal captain at the time. And he put, no way. yeah, he put the word in. And then uh, they called me and I thought it was my university friends like playing a prank because we used to just do it to each other all the time. So it took me three days to call them back. And then I just found myself in the Arsenal boardroom, like still not believing it. So whether or not humanoid robots were in my mind at that point, I'd be lying if I said yes. But as a young boy, I uh, built my first Lego humanoid robot at like 10 years old. So they've always been um, on the horizon. Oh, that's so cool. What a story, man. What And, and life has a way of happening like that happenstance is super cool to see so you did then go from arsenal and i imagine you got the bug the entrepreneurial bug because you started a wearables company right can you tell me a little bit about that yeah of course um again another funny story so um, i'm in new york uh arsenal's de delivering one of their soccer camps in new york or football camps of course don't want to lose any friends and uh uh, Donald Trump's uh, son rolls up with two security guards and uh, this was like quite a high profile camp and I was the head coach or the technical director there so I was in charge of the camp and the kids and the program and I just thought like this is like Donald Trump's child and I'm in charge I don't know who he is I know nothing about him so I was like how cool would it be if he had like a wristband or something similar to like a festival band but something that he could use on a re like a repeated basis. So I had like a non-disposable wristband, um, similar to like the Whoop product that they have in basketball. Uh, I know there's lots of fans of Whoop around the world and we were all about collecting the player data. I thought if, if a player ever collapsed and I knew nothing about them, I could just scan it with my phone using NFC and it would kind of give me a full profile of um, that person, any medical histories and contact details. So yeah. Okay, so this was more about identifying the different players more than like tracking your heart rate and that type of thing? In the beginning, yeah. I mean, we started small, so in the beginning we just thought, all right, let's pack it with all the real plain text data. And then uh, we started developing uh, more kinematic data, understanding player movement, tracking, distance covered, like you say, heart rate, recovery rate, this sort of thing, yeah. Wow, that is incredible. So that got you into the world of hardware, I imagine. And what made you then get the inspiration to jump in even deeper and start creating robotics? Cool. So um, I don't know, it's like 
more funny stories. I was working with an investment company from Tel Aviv. There's a guy called Mayo there, and he uh, just said, you know, I would have an idea. He's like, oh, you can do that. That's easy. And everything I said, he'd be like, oh, we could do that. That's easy. And he's just his attitude and his approach to tech. I just thought, like, this guy has such a can-do attitude. So I, I was I adopted that. And one of uh, my business partners previously was like, you know, how are we going to pivot now? It's, we've got the lockdown. No children are in sport. And I just told him, let's, let's just build a robot. We can do that. It's easy. And uh, he was like, well, do you have instructions for how to do that? I said, look, great ideas rarely come with instructions. You know, it's about you looking at it figuring it out what do you want it to do with of course my bioma biomechanics degree i had a good understanding of how the human body works i'm in sport i've got a good understanding of how those things work so i just went and picked up an arduino and self-taught my taught myself 12 months later I had a full humanoid robot that was um fully functional and it still sits in our office today you know you can see that in our linkedin pages and i'm sure there'll be links to that after but uh yeah it's uh that's kind of how we got there but you know I don't give myself the credit. I think like we live in a time now, if you want to know something, you just ask either an LLM, like a large language model, or you go to Google and or you go to YouTube and you just kind of sit with the, the videos and you just break it up into small pieces. And that's really what we did. And, and, and the output was, of course, a humanoid robot called Pablo. Pablo. I do like your naming conventions, which we'll get into in a sec. And so... That was the inspiration that, that gave you the confidence, I imagine, to recognize that, hey, there's something here when it comes to robotics. And what then, what were the next steps in creating Islington Robotica? So I'd read a book, Industry 4.0, and a subsequent book, The Next 100 Years. And both of those books, yeah, they're really cool. I mean, go and find them. But those books, like, just explained like how quickly humanity is evolving and um what's kind of happened in the last 50 years is just so monumentally so much so so much movement has happened in the last 50 years versus the previous 500 years specifically in tech that i knew that uh i, I don't want to call it the dawn of robotics or the dawn of ai but we were really at the dawn of ai you know in terms of like just information. So if we just take the information aspect of it, there was nothing that I wanted to know that I couldn't find out, as I mentioned before. So, you know, that was that was what really led me, mainly Industry 4.0, like moving from Industry 3.0, for those that don't know, that's just like uh, manufacturing, manufacturing lines, and then 4.0 being the layer technology and, on that. So um, I knew that robotics had to play a, a critical role um, in all of this and our, our our initial idea for Pablo was all about search and rescue or for going into like unsafe places for humans where we had coronavirus uh, there would have been a great uh, adoption there for robots to go and either remove or bring things to people who were either at risk or were risky to others um, uh -huh. I saw that that it was the time yeah that makes sense but is it still that no, so uh, really Pablo was a research project. So we wanted to, I, you know, from my previous company with the wearables, I was surrounded by technology enthusiasts, experts, and uh, leaders. And so when I kind of run these ideas past them, they just went, Nate, you've, you've done it again. You come up with another wonderful idea at the right time. So that gave me the confidence. And I was working with a guy called Dr. Rob Merrifield, who was one of the pioneers in keyhole surgery. And he, yeah, he was uh, one of my mentors and we would meet every Friday for an Indian. This was just at the, just at the dawn of the, uh, of the pandemic. We didn't really know it was going to take full effect. Um, and then I just kind of went away and just did, did it in my own time, uh, kept giving him updates and such like, and he was like, look, I really think you're onto something. But we knew that it was a bit early. We knew that in 2019, we were just too early for, for the humanoid form factor. So we, we kind of changed it a little bit, but not not like a crazy 360 pivot. Okay. And so what has it morphed into since the pandemic? Sure. So um, since the pandemic or during the pandemic, I lost a few friends. Just they were unable to cope like mentally and like life became tough. And so that was really hard. And I realized that 
like we're in a, we're we're more more connected now ever than ever, but most disconnected. You know, like we're a really lonely society. A lot of people spend their times with passive devices, and the the kind of days go by. The you know, it seems seems like time's accelerating. Uh, we're stuck behind these devices. There isn't much interaction. And I thought of what would be a good way to remove the device, have an intermediary that was still technology, because we don't want to re remove the technology. We want to keep the technology, but we still want the social interaction. Um, and like just voice, like how important it is to hear voice. It doesn't, it doesn't even matter whose voice it is at this point. Like we all watched every movie. We all completed our whole box sets. But if it doesn't talk back to you or answer your questions, it kind of becomes redundant at that point. I think voice plays a major part in that. So it morphed into uh, a smaller bot. Uh, I'll I'll do a name reveal when you're ready. But uh, this this small this smaller object is just like a companion. It answers any of your most ridiculous questions, your darkest fears, your general day to day things. Um, I'm due to get married soon, and I asked it, told my robot that I was pretty apprehensive about getting married, like just how life would change and. My robot did a good job of appeasing me and pacifying me and making me not worried. So uh -huh. this uh, one of our, our strap line of the company is code for good. Uh, so this is really what it's all about. It's about tackling loneliness and education. Oh, fascinating. There is a piece that I think I wanted to get into with you when it comes to voice. And you mentioned it here, how important it is to be able to talk to someone and how right now it feels like we're at a point where we just get a sliver of the actual data when it comes to the conversations that we have. Like the conversation that you and I are having right now is through a computer and so we're losing a ton, but we still see our facial expressions. We still are understanding the cadence and the way that we're communicating, the words we're using are one piece. So everybody's probably heard that statistic where it says, you know, 10% of what someone understands is the words that you're saying. And the other 90% is like how you deliver those words. When it comes to interacting with technology, that 90% feels like it, it falls off completely. How are you thinking about solving for that? Sure. So I absolutely agree with everything you said, uh, and you, you kind of got me thinking. So uh, I, I'm not sure if you've seen it, but most people have like the the wolf, the wolf of Wall Street, uh, Jordan oh, Belfort. Yeah. Of course, he wrote a book called The Way of the Wolf, and uh, it talks about uh, straight line selling. And a lot of that book focuses on tonality. So you kind of said 10% is the words and 90% is like the rest of it, but if we're talking about communication as a whole, I still think that that, that is like a, a bun next to a cake. So communication is the cake and you've got this, this little bun next to it, which is voice. I really believe that um, voice is mainly how we kind of output life. Uh, when we describe life, when we, you know, oh, I went to this amazing party last week and this and that and this is what happened, but you lose so much data um, just through explanation. So yeah, so much is lost just through explaining things like a story kind of is made up of this huge cake and voice is really just like a slice out of that cake. You needed to be there to see it, to smell it, touch it, taste it, feel it. And I believe this is like the communication language. Um, I feel like as languages develop, as they always have over the years, we're able, you know, we have new words that help us describe things and voice becomes more complex. I think um, if we can continue to develop the sounds and the words that we use, we can start painting better pictures and tap back into the imagination, which fills in the other slices of the cake. Um, but definitely voice is like the final frontier for any story. Um, it's kind of where it comes. It's, it always boils down to how the story is told. In all, in uh, ancient African civilizations, you'd have a storyteller who would go around the village and he would spread knowledge all through story, no book, and his voice would be carefully selected by the villagers, based on, like you say, his cadence, his tonality, 
and his ability to trigger someone's imagination all in the hope of filling in those missing slices so that they can get, you know, reproduce 70, 75% of what it may have been like at the time of the story that he's telling a long time ago kind of sets the scene for all, all storytellers yeah. or back in Africa some time, you know, and this is all about voice. I think uh, if we just talk about that and robotics, like we knew that one of the most important features in robotics was going to be that voice piece, the interaction, um, the conversational style speech. And yeah, I just think voice is huge. The reason for voice being so powerful for the robotics is like, that's almost what differentiates it from just getting a dog or a cat maybe that and not having to like clean up after the dog or cat i guess and it is always there i do i've been given a thought experiment though when it comes to these personal robotics that are for friendship as opposed to utility and the thought experiment was Okay, and, and I would love to hear how you think about this because you are the one who ultimately is creating it. So uh, I want to know what your stance on it is. And it's basically saying, I let's imagine that I come home from work and the robot asks me, so how was your day at work? And I go, ah. Oh. And I go into my complaining mode and I say, you know, Nathan was being just a pain in my butt and then I had this guy who wouldn't stop talking to me and it was so annoying and then my boss came over and he said this and I just kind of go down this road of complaining and I need to vent that right maybe that's all right for one day but and the robot answers however the robot answers the maybe the robot consoles me says like oh, okay tell me more and all right yeah but what happens if, like, I do that for five days in a row? Is the robot going to get sassy with me and start to say, like, yo, Demetrius, this is the fifth day in a row that you're coming home talking about Nathan. Can we get over it already? You know? And so where does the place of the robot come in? Because it's almost like you're giving it inherently a lot of power in how it can help direct you and guide you and guide your mental states you know i love this question and this kind of leads into uh and this thought experiment we've we've actually cast this same question many times in in our offices uh when we were building the emotion center so you, you know you coming in you've complained five days in a row about this guy nathan and how annoying he is and like part one like misery loves company so if you tried, if we tried to program the robot to be like, oh, Demetrius, like you're a strong, powerful leader and, you know, we all look up to you and you shouldn't feel that way, then that's not really going to pacify your aches. That could get your back up even more just because of the way, like from a psychological standpoint, the way that we're wired, we want to be heard. You know, when you were explaining that to me, I was trying to not process an answer, but to really hear what you were saying listening with that intent to understand what you were saying and what you were feeling. And the robot doesn't get tired. The robot doesn't have bills coming at the end of the month. So a lot of the reason why uh, we're so short-tempered is because like we've got other things to get on with. So I'm going to listen to you once because I'm your friend. I'm going to listen to you twice because we're best friends. And the third time, I'm going to give you advice. But the fourth and fifth time, like, you know, I've I, I, I got to get back to work, dude. Like, you need, you need to go speak to someone or seek therapy is often an option but you know the robot doesn't get tired of hearing you and um is happy to sit in your misery with you for as long as it takes for you to kind of um come around to the fact that you're not moving anywhere you're stagnating in between like the nuances of all this we have like uh what we call the nba which is like next best action so if someone's like complained for like a month straight then in between that, like the robot might put some positive triggers or anchors out there just to try and really help move that kind of thought train into, an, into another lane. Like let's 
let's kind of switch lanes with this a little bit, but not at the time of complaining. Uh, when Ki uh, Seven Habits, Stephen R. Covey, says, like, there's a story about a guy who's complained about the referee sending him off during a game. And uh, instead of, like, re replying to his son, like, oh, you know, you're a great player, you shouldn't worry about the ref, he kind of, like, got onto the level of the kid and he was saying like, man, maybe, well, you know, that's really sad that the, the referees behave like that. Maybe there's something wrong with the referee. And the kid was like, yeah, you know, maybe there is something wrong with the referee and started to feel bad for the referee and tapping into those deeper emotional senses that we have access to that robots don't, but they know that, um, or we can program in such a way that we know we can trigger the empathy, uh, scales in humans to help break from those cycles. So Honestly, like complain away. The robot loves it. Never gets tired of hearing your moans, but is always ready to switch lanes with you. And as soon as you do switch lanes, like happiness loves company as much as misery loves company. So as soon as you're bubbly and joyous, the robot's not going to be like, oh, we've been moaning for 30 days. Um, let's go back to the moaning phase. Uh, you know, the robot's going to be, he's going to reciprocate and mirror where you're at. So um, I do think that there is value in robotic companionship. So this is kind of what we're badgering on it here. But I think like without really suffocating the point, it's just about mirroring. So the robot is able to mirror you and you can come in with your true pure intentions and feelings and thoughts and just kind of, you know, the robot kind of loves it. Yeah. I like that answer. I think it is a interesting road that you get to walk along because there are so many questions like that and edge cases that you could potentially encounter as you have a robot companion that is with you and the kind of things that people will bring up to the robot right and so you being the builder behind the robot you're going to encounter so many different pieces that you probably could never think of right now and then you you have to make those hard decisions on like how are we going to navigate this situation yeah dude i mean we actually use deep gram um for our our speech to text and or text to speech actually in both directions and um one of the things i mean there is an ethical challenge that we're faced with which is how much of that user where does the user privacy end um, with us, without us kind of trying to constantly develop features, there will be a day where we're like, okay, like that's enough user feedback for you know, verbose statement for what they said. We might get the sentiment. So a thousand users feel sad on a Monday as like a high level viewpoint, but we don't always necessarily need to know specifically the questions that the user is asking. Because we want to respect that privacy and allow the user to interact with their bot and feel like uh, there isn't an audience behind the curtain. Yeah. Um, so this is like really important. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. I think people would be a lot more reserved if it's like, wait, is this thing just relaying back everything that I'm saying to the creators? But at the same time, if it starts, if someone starts talking about potentially important subjects that somebody needs to intervene on not a robot that's another dicey question that you have to decide when those things need to be escalated up yeah of course we have a panel dedicated purely to the eth ethics and the ethical side of this like if there's anything that's um going to cause harm to another human being then we want to be able to not kind of facilitate that even if it's to their own self or humanity or the progression of humanity in general, there are some challenges, nuance that comes within having that level of information. Um, similar to like Facebook, you know, like Facebook decided to change the header bar to not like, not like tell us something about your day to like what's on your mind. And you know, that's like the, that's like the final line of privacy. Um, and through robotics, because you've got the anthropomorphic scale where, like you mentioned the dog, like the dog doesn't really speak to you. Well, you kind of get signs of life from a dog, but you know that you can just kind of like tell your dog all the things that you love and hate and your dog won't judge you. It probably won't understand too much. But whereas the robot probably does have a level of comprehension now. So um, 
like I said, there has to be a panel of people who decide, how, you know, okay, what is detrimental to mankind and uh, the future of mankind and what actually is private? What What is something that we want to work on? And a lot of the time, if there is any triggers like this, the robot is able to like suggest, like, you know, for example, if someone's drinking heavily, they say, okay, like you can call these people. Um, if someone's really struggling with mental health, okay, the, here's the list of organizations you may want to speak to. But yeah, it is. It's 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 a beautiful and and a, and a harsh uh, subject topic to discuss. But it is the sort of thing that we have to consider and we have to really look at. Wow, I'm just thinking through all those yeah all those scenarios and all that all the ways that you want to be thoughtful about how you interact and what you do and the policies that you put in place. I just like to say though, the robot isn't always listening. So um, oh, okay. this is something that's really important. So the gate is closed until you open it. And then whenever you open that gate and you want to volunteer that information. So for example, if family were having a discussion and our two parents were having a, a marriage that's not going so well, the robot's not sort of sitting in the corner, like enjoying listening to this conversation and thinking, oh, well, like maybe I can sell. Here's some therapist numbers that yeah, you might want to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go out of the window at that point. I mean, if the robot's turn around <laughs> and say like, hey, look, here's marriage advice, cool, plus one, nine, nine, five, you know, like to reel off a number, I think it'd be out of the window. But as soon as like the couple decide that they want to turn to the robot, instead of, instead of like spending heavily on therapy, they've already bought the robot. So they may turn to the robot and be like, hey, robot's name, what do you think we should do in this situation? And then using large language models and a whole load of like cross-section data, we'd be able to pull up the NBA, like the next next best action um, that right. it feels for that user. Uh, bearing in mind, the robot does get to know the users. So it, like the robot roughly has an IQ of around 56 IQ points, which is equivalent to like a six-year-old child or a Doberman or a golden retriever. So it, it does learn your, uh, your behaviors and your characteristics. And it probably already knows that there's things happening if you told it, mm -hmm. this is the power of voice, right? So you wouldn't know any of this without voice. And the more voice points and data points that you're able to collect, the better, the, the better the story. And then the more pieces you're filling to this cake I mentioned before, dude. Thank you for coming on here and talking to me about this because I am infinitely intrigued by what you're doing. And I love your story of going from talking to the captain of Arsenal to hanging out with Trump's son and then a Tel Aviv VC or a money making machine with the can do attitude and deciding to create a robot that is going to keep us company. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure and I love talking about these things. So thank you so much and we'll speak more.